doing this interview and practice uh, Rolls Royce. So it's a very cool production, kind of like a podcast kind of thing, kind of like what we're doing now, but you're driving around in Rolls Royce. That sounds great until you need to get sound. Mm. Uh, and so I came up there and I was like, yeah, sure, I can do this. And then he handed me like three GoPros, uh, a Zoom. I was like, bye. Okay, welcome to Filmmaking Framed, the video podcast interviewing industry professionals to find out the tips and tricks to make it behind the silver screen. As always, I co-host Tom Dexter and myself, Daniel Hughes. Hello. Today we are with a camera operator working across films, across video games, VFX, uh, reference camera, that sort of thing. So Sam, let's start off with our first question. Please describe your role to an audience and assume they don't know anything. Yeah, so uh, I'm a camera operator, which means that I operate a camera. <laughs> uh, applause. Yeah, right. Uh, sometimes I might supply my own equipment, which is often expected for some roles. For example, like city camming uh, and other roles, the studio might supply something for like if I'm doing reference camera. Uh, it's it's a huge broad spectrum, um, and definitely camera operating in itself can take you to many different uh, areas. Like one moment you might be in a really comfortable studio, your uh, lunch always arrives on time. <laughs> There's breakfast. It's fantastic. And another time you're like out in the middle of nowhere in a country that you don't really know particularly well and it's wet, everything's muddy. You don't know how to get the AD's attention and everything's going wrong. And <laughs> then you're back in a studio again <laughs> or maybe like a an arena or filming sports. Uh, sometimes you're doing a whole lot of exercise and you're running about and you're carrying lugging equipment and other times uh, it's fairly relaxing, it's fairly organized and uh, you have lots of assistance to help you out. So it's a huge like spectrum of different uh, experiences that you can definitely have as a camera operator. And uh, how do you just from that how do you decide which job to take? Do you go, hmm, I really fancy standing in a cold muddy field next week? Or it's just kind of what work comes in? How do you sort of decide on what jobs you take? Uh, we see I have a uh, really good system to decide what work I have and when to book it. So I look at my calendar and if there's nothing <laughs> there, I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just hope that nothing else also pops up on the same day. That's a great system. Yeah. Yeah. And one adopted by many people in the industry, I can promise you. <laughs> So how did you get into the industry? How did you hear about it? When did you know you wanted to do it? Um, I, f I first kind of like fell in love with cameras at a very young age because my mum was a, photog uh, a photographer for uh, architectural buildings mm -hmm. uh, and she was a freelancer. And so I was always around like cameras and lights and all those kind of stuff. And so I kind of picked it up. Uh, and then when I went to school, I found that I was enjoyed uh anything with a camera really mm -hmm. and those were the uh classes that i also got better marks in so i kept on doing them uh <laughs> and i could focus on uh so really when i was like sort of gcse's kind of time i always went with like photography and media studies yeah um turns out media studies is a huge spectrum <laughs> And so when you first go there, you're like, oh, sweet, we're going to be playing with cameras, we're going to do editing, we're going to making films. And then you're just studying like the way of film from like uh, the 1920s. And you're like, this isn't quite exactly and what you, I had in you mind. cover things like advertising yeah. and marketing as well and those sort of things. Yeah, like making magazines and stuff like yeah. that. And you're like, this isn't what I expected. This isn't uh, specialized enough. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so I went through school, I got pretty good marks because i basically dropped every other subject especially in a level and i just focus on photography and uh yep. media studies mm. uh because i had a plan and my plan was to do foundation because i was the last year in the uk that I could get foundation for free so okay kind of had to do it <laughs> explain to, uh, to someone who doesn't know what that is uh so foundation is like just a very broad what's well, meant to be a broad spectrum of like 
different subjects that you might have interest in, but you're not quite sure if you really want to go into like three or four years studying and uh, putting a lot of money for something that you might not actually like. Yeah. Um, and also gets you used to like university life. And so I went to Bournemouth University. Um, nice well, time. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very nice place. I actually yeah. loved Bournemouth. Um, bit small. Love like... I never had a place that had so many old people, but also so many drug dealers at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and that prepared you for film. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw the, seeing all the ADs be like, I know exactly what you like. <laughs> so the foundation course, it's, is it kind of like the American system, in which in the American system, you, you don't pick your major straight away. So you, you study... A bunch of different things and then you go oh this is what i'm going to focus on and this is what i'm going to qualify in so when you were doing that foundation course did you was there a moment where you had to go yep i want to carry this on or yep i want to change direction or i want to drop out is that yeah um well lucky because lucky for me uh born university had a course that was perfect for me mm. because it was a course called foundation lens based media which was just photography and film Mm. So it happened to be the only two subjects that I took at GCSE, yeah. not GCSE A levels. Yeah, <laughs> and it happened to be what you wanted media studies to be. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of like uh, experimentation. It was very like it was, it was an arts university. Mm. Um, it wasn't quite like the big productions and uh, like regimented uh, schedule that mm. the actual film industry is like. But it got me a good like understanding, and so I ended up going towards the film side. Mostly because film is just so much more collaborative than photography. Because mm. I did a few like photo shoots and I assisted on a few photo shoots as well. And what I really found was that there's like there's the photographer, and then there's like the assistants. Uh, obviously, there's lots of different like assistants and different hierarchies in that. Yeah. Uh, but what I liked about film was that there was many different types of heads that you could be. Like mm. there's. There's the cinematographer, the producer, the director, the editor, and all these people, and they have like equal weight in the industry. Mm. It's not just like, oh, I'm assisting for photography. Yeah. It's like, I am, this is like my department. This yeah. is everything that I like uh, care for. <laughs> yeah. Did you discuss with your mom at that stage if she'd gone down the photography route for the architecture and that sort of thing? Did you discuss with her? about whether you wanted to do photography or film or it just you just knew and she was totally down with that um i don't really know honestly <laughs> i mean like obviously talked a lot about photography because i was yeah. studying it for like years in mm. school and uh, i was also assisting her sometimes uh, on shoots and stuff like that um and it yeah i mean she definitely helped a lot uh in that and was able to taught me through like cameras and stuff like that um she wasn't too knowledgeable about the actual videography and mm. the video side of stuff um but it kind of translates over especially thanks to the uh 5d mark ii what an amazing camera wow when that bad boy came out like all your all your like photography and like videography needs they were they were set they were done <laughs> what an amazing camera <laughs> came out in a perfect time especially for me um and you could mean that i could build oh, i could do two things at once with one one kit incredible <laughs> and now it's just the norm <laughs> like try getting like a dslr that doesn't film yeah um i had just before we go further down the road of the life of sam into where you are now i'd be interested that some of the younger listeners who are maybe at that A level stage or GCSE stage who want to end up where you are or in the industry, would you say that media studies was worth doing retrospectively, or would you say that you think that you wish you'd done something else to get to to this point? Hmm. I say like it is worth it, much because there's no other option really. Um, it does get you out there it does make you understand the different roles in media it's just the issue is that it's so broad it's kind of like art in a sense like if you study just 
art like that could be anything <laughs> yeah um and that's the same issue with media is that i want to be a filmmaker but you also have to study now advertisement and magazines and all that kind of stuff uh, i almost say that better way to get into it is really not really focusing too much on like what your school can provide but more that what you can provide uh so going out with your friends and making a short film like you're gonna learn far more from just messing around the camera editing it putting in the credits realizing huh maybe i shouldn't credit myself like 10 times it looks kind of weird <laughs> <laughs> um and you learn far more uh just from doing that than uh actually like in class uh i'm like obviously when you hit like university and college and stuff like that yeah, it changes drastically um i mean there might be some better courses out there uh if, especially if, if you're going for like the college route uh because i did my a levels like eight years ago i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how long ago that was but it was a while <laughs> i'm like calculating how old i am now oh my god Tw 24 20 right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's not dwell that's not dwell <laughs> As I've got a somber feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your first paid job in the industry? My first paid job. Or it could be the first, one of your first jobs that jumps out to you. Yeah. So when you were still in the establishing your name phase. Yeah, that is hard because quite a lot of like the first jobs you get, you're very happy to just be like, yes, I will do that. I will do that for the experience. Yeah. And then you get screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of my, one of the uh, first things that really sticks out to me um, about when I was filming, uh, just uh, starting out of my, my career, uh, I was still sort of doing it for like for free and doing it off my own back. Um and just like contacting like family friends and stuff like that i got in contact with someone who would like needed some help uh filming doing this interview in the back of this uh Rolls royce so it's a very cool production kind of like a podcast kind of thing kind of like what we're doing now but you're driving around a Rolls royce that sounds great until you need to get sound mm. uh and so i came up there and i was like yeah sure i can do this and then he handed me like three gopros uh a zoom i was like bye and just <laughs> left me i was like i don't know how old i was 17 <laughs> i didn't know what i was doing i recorded everything the sound got a bit messed up it went on far later that stuff we didn't have any lights i was in charge of getting equipment <laughs> and so that really steps out to me that some things are best just to say no especially if you're just going for experience i mean like it also in itself, it was a good experience. Do you be like, oh, yeah, no, I shouldn't be doing stuff like this. That I should look more into it, making sure that there's, and makes you realize why there are multiple people um, in the industry yeah. and why there's multiple separate jobs. Like if I had a sound guy with me, just any kind of sound recorders or just someone that's just looking out for the sound, it would have been infinitely better. Uh, if I just focusing just, so I could just focus just on the camera and I find that quite a lot, actually, when you're saying you're starting off a film, people just sort of sneak sound in there because it's such an afterthought. It's a reason it's a huge department. It is so hard because you can't see it. At least with cameras, you can be like, that's recording. I see what the image is. But with sound, it's like, I can't see that. Yeah. <laughs> in, my, in my experience on sets, crews are rarely louder than when there is a request for room tone. <laughs> because it's you know you shoot the scene and everyone's got to be quiet because they're rolling and the foot the ads will start shouting if you don't and then they're like cool we've got that scene moving on and the sound will be like room tone and everyone who's been waiting to move their equipment is like anyway yeah. like, <laughs> i'm amazed that sound are so friendly considering how hard their jobs are yeah famously they say that a beautifully shot film with all awful sound is worse than a bit of a shoddily shot film with beautiful sound. Yeah, because it's artistic, you know. It's like, oh, we use it like a crappy camera and the image is all off. It's like, it's, that's our artistic choice. Mm. We decided to go for this very cheap like camcorder look, not because it was the only camera we could afford, but because it gave that 
that ambience, that look <laughs> yeah, they were yeah. going for. It's on scene. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you can't be like, yeah, we called it on a phone because we just felt it was better. Like <laughs> just, just the sound. <laughs> yeah. So, so going back a bit then. So mm. you finished your course at Bournemouth. Yep. Uh, how soon after that did you start working in an industry or what, what were your next steps immediately from graduating? Uh, after that, I took a year off. I just tried to look for work in the industry. That's when I did the job in the back of the Rolls Royce. Uh, and looking for other things, I did like small like videography stuff. I didn't really go into any big film sets. Um, I did a, I assisted at least on a um, promotion video for the Coldstream Guards uh, for the military branch. That was very cool. That was very cool. They were shooting blanks and everything. I did. I still don't think I've been on anything like that kind of like level of like intensity before or like since, <laughs> which is kind of sad. I'd love to be with something more like that. Um, I mean, the first plan was to have like tanks and all that kind of stuff coming in, but it that's all fell through. So it was just them running around the field shooting blanks, which is still very fun. Um, and I did some traveling. I uh, just going around and really preparing myself for uh, going for the next stage because I knew where I was already going to go um, to a uh, school in London. Uh, I went to that school not because like I really wanted to go to it, more because I knew I wanted to be in London because I wanted to be a filmmaker in this larger space. Um, otherwise, I would just stayed in Bournemouth. But I knew that most of my contacts would have came from the course which was right like if I didn't if I stayed in Bournemouth did my BA there moved to uh, London I would have had no idea where I meant to be starting it's one of the few things that there, there's always a strong argument either side about whether you should go into education for studying film or not mm. and like you said earlier about your media studies it's about what you do outside of that education so you, you go to a course and yes, you're learning some stuff and it will be, some will be useful, some won't. But the connections you make, you find other people who have the same drive as you or the same passion as you. And then you learn and build those connections. And then years later, they still come up. Yeah, uh, totally. Like probably what you learn and what's actually in the course, if you just go there like day to day as if you're going to like a nine to five, you're probably only getting like 25% of the actual experience. The rest of the experience is meeting people making those friends, making those connections. And it happens naturally, far more naturally than going to a, uh, <laughs> uh, what are they called? Those events that you like mingle. Networking mixes. Yes. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Speed dating for jobs. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to ask, where were you from originally? Where, was, where, was, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in uh, Wiltshire uh, okay. on, the, on the border. So Wiltshire, Berkshire, near Hungford, Newbury, area so, so your choices were home Bournemouth or you go off to London and do this other course yeah yeah I mean Bournemouth was still very far away from yeah. <laughs> Wiltshire uh I, I ended up going really to Bournemouth for the course I didn't go to Bournemouth because oh, I really want to go to Bournemouth <laughs> it, I end up really liking Bournemouth just from sheer coincidence because mm. it just ended up being a nice place but it was very quiet like very quiet uh like you can often hear a penny drop in that town. Uh, apart from at night, which when all the students funny came out from their their student accommodations, yeah, <laughs> their, their grubby halls. <laughs> so, what was the course that you studied in London? What was the title of it? It was a uh, two-year BA intensive course. So we went through the summer, which was actually really nice, uh, and it was a. Uh, practical filmmaking so the idea was that you go there they teach you like the practical aspects of it and uh so you can go straight from there onto set uh nice idea there's a lot of other places that actually do very similar things mm -hmm. uh, especially in london uh but it was really just to like cement myself in london and get those contacts in london uh and finding people especially people that wanted to be practical in film uh, was also a big thing for me because uh, I knew if I went to this course that was targeting people that want to be like working in the industry 
and going for it, you won't be finding the people that didn't really want to be there. Uh, those people were still there, surprisingly. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> it is incredible. The amount of people that you make friends with in like, uh, film courses that then just didn't go off and do film. Mm. They then find, you know, actual happiness in life. <laughs> <laughs> Their partners know what they look like. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I suppose I remember when I was much younger that the, a lot of my peers were trying to decide whether to do university courses and stuff in film, and that is something to consider: is how practical the course is, and if that's what you're interested in, then that's what you need to look for. And Sometimes they're very theoretical based, which might be fine if you know you want to go into curating or archiving or into film analysis. programming, analysis, that sort of thing. In which case, theoretical courses are fantastic. But if you are wanting to get on set and work with a camera or, or any other department, then definitely look for those practical courses. Mm. Have you... And a, and a question I'd advise students to ask when they're going to call up is, you know, what kit, would I be able to just rent out and go and shoot stuff with? Um, so I know from Tom's experience, that's something he has done a lot. And I'm imagining you will have done the same on all your courses and then you go out and shoot stuff with your friends. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, the equipment is always uh, good. I'm trying to think of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I definitely should have looked more into the equipment when I first joined, but... Uh, that, that actually comes on to a good one of if you were at the point where you're you're thinking I'm, they're going to go have value of going and getting a course and you're going to do some research now what are the things that you're like so for example the media course you were like oh this is way broader than just the practical elements like mm. what kind of stuff would you use to filter if you could if you were born again and you were that age and you were looking for a uni course to go for that was a terribly worded question, but we we'll ignore that. You know, I'm trying to think if I think also reputation is very important um, because most of that comes from uh, people's experience. Um, try to see if there's some reviews about it as well, mm -hmm. uh, and if you're, it's hard because most of the good courses that you find are what people talk about on set. I didn't really go on set until you'd done some of the courses. Very chicken and eggy. Yeah, it is. Um, maybe if I was starting all over again, I would try my best to get onto uh, productions by being like a runner or something, uh, just starting out. And then going up to the people in the uh, at, on doing the jobs that you kind of see yourself doing yep. and just ask them how they kind of got there. Uh, what courses they did even if they did a course um, quite a lot of people didn't quite a lot of people actually went if I was on again I could have I probably would have gone down the route of just going straight into a rental house which is what I end up doing anyway after uh, that, BA. that's a great shout really good way to learn the kit and I assume not having done it meet the people who are coming in to rent the kit and then going I'm free on weekends or what hours do you tend to work in a rental house? Yeah, it's like nine to five. Monday to Friday, so you've got the weekend yeah. to... Yeah, they, they, I mean, they might ask you back um, and then you get obviously extra pay for going, being there for the weekend. Yeah. Um, my experience is that they're pretty flexible. Um, obviously, like, <laughs> turn up <laughs> 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 every day, Monday, Friday, uh, nine to five. Uh, often a little bit early, uh, get ready to make a little teas, uh, make sure your coffee game's good. Um, <laughs> Surprisingly valuable. <laughs> yeah, it is, like, just, just through life. <laughs> and in that vein, not to endorse smoking, but I have had bosses who were massive smokers who we've been filming on set at 2 a.m. and I carried a packet when I was a junior and I would offer them one and they'd be like, you're a lifesaver, I'm going to take you on the next job. And I'm like, I'm glad that... I'm glad you will, but I wish that it was also on my practical skills, but you know. That that is genius. That is <laughs> that, that is a good lesson for anyone who wants to come to the industry. Play on their addictions. <laughs> it, it is. And another boss, 
phone was always dead. Bought five battery packs. He was like, oh my God, Daniel, I can't imagine doing a job without you. I'm, my phone's always dying. And you're like, yeah, of course. I'm, definitely hire me for this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> How many of those battery packs did you lose? No comment, Your Honour. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's a good short way to put it. Play on your boss's addictions and they will hire you more. <laughs> But it it also goes into that wider thing of be useful. Yeah, yeah. Make their life as easy as you can, so that they're like, I just want to get Sam in because Sam just makes it. Especially because at the start you don't have the technical build abilities to compete on, but if you can make and and having a good sense of humour, being optimistic, being smiley, if you can lift the team morale, that's valuable because you'll make people with technical skills better at their jobs. So you compensate for your lack of learning at that point. Mm. Which is why when you become good, you can become grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> that is a truth we've just hit on. <laughs> if you could go back and give a piece of advice to your younger self, whether it was from you, from your experience, or if you wish someone had given it to you, what would that have been? Uh, it would probably just be just keep going. Like The industry is just a hard place to get into. And it's all about just being there at the right time and just not giving up. Just like getting ready to hunker down and knowing that this is what you want to do. Uh, and also understand that there's going to be points in the year that for some reason you're just not going to get work and you're just going to have to find a way of surviving through that. Um, and also getting like a part-time job somewhere else, sometimes not connected to the film industry. That's okay. That's yeah. okay to just work in a cafe for like, uh, on the weekends or every every other day, you know, and then let them know that you can't make it because you're doing a film thing. And it, f it feels like it's really important to get part-time jobs that offer you maximum flexibility. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, as well, I often go for like cafes or some pubs and stuff like that and being straightforward with them, saying, by the way, I am, I am in film uh, and so I won't be able to commit 100% to this job that's what I'm looking for like a part time or a zero hour contract just something they can just keep you going can like pay like most of the rent <laughs> if hopefully all of it <laughs> if, you're, if you just can't work if you just haven't got any work that month at all and just know that it's like it's okay like some people might be further ahead of you at like coming straight out of university and it's it's okay. Like, don't get stressed out about it. <laughs> yeah. And and some people have advantages you won't. I mean, even putting aside parents in the industry or family friends or just it, there'll be people who their parents live in London, so they can live with their parents while they're establishing themselves. And that that means you might have to do work outside the industry to pay your bills, but you can build a name, and then you can earn really good money once you're in. Yeah. Yeah, also just like keep being happy that you're there, really. Don't, even if you're miserable, don't let people know that you're like upset. Like go like cry in the Luton for a little bit. It's okay. <laughs> Sometimes you have to schedule at that time. Yeah. <laughs> you do have to schedule that time, unfortunately. It's got the radio. I'm going 10 1, which, yeah. which it means going to the toilet. I'm yeah. Going 10 1, but you're out. You're going for a cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that? Like you say about always staying positive, obviously it can be really hard when you, you're doing crazy hours and how how do you how have you found working with other people? Do you find there are certain people that I don't know if this is even a question, but they, what what are the character traits you see in people that make that so much harder to be around? Oh people that stress out. People that make like tiny little things and just blow out of proportion. Especially people that are not even like higher ups from you, people that are like on the same level as you and they're like f freaking out or they're like or even getting like angry because of it. And it's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa calm down. So that's what I often do uh, to like either like de-stress or make someone else de-stress, especially if, if they made a mistake or something like that, is just remind them that we're making films. We're not saving lives. We're not doctors. We're, we're not, we're not, forming people's like uh we're not changing the course of history here we're making a movie yeah. and the most important thing is that people are like safe 
and that we just can just carry on doing this. If we didn't get all the shots, if if something messes up, it's like it's okay. No one's like died. No one's injured. We can all go back home. Yeah. <laughs> I can't stress enough how right you are on that. And every top class professional that I've ever worked with across departments has expressed that to me at some point. That and it it just feels like it it will take you time because it's cinema and it's magic and there's actors and there's this and but like when you know you've really settled into your craft when you can go this matters. I will give this a lot of time. I give this a lot of focus, a lot of attention, a lot of stress but it is only film and TV. And when you can still be excited, but go, you know, if we're going to run over or we have to come back to get this shot or, you know, the coverage wasn't great or whatever, it is not, as long as no one's hurt, as long as no one's injured, it's not worth sacrificing your happiness over those kind of stresses. Or health. Or health. Yeah. Even if you are stressed, just like, don't show it as much. You can, it's quite easy to not show that you're stressed by just your body language. Don't put your hand like on your head when you're asking for something. Uh, don't like, like, don't do like big like intakes of air. Just like talk to people calmly. Like if, if someone's like messed up, just like yep. let let them know. <laughs> but don't be like, <laughs> oh, like like they've just like crashed your car because they haven't. They've like maybe ruined a shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And I suppose in that vein, don't take things so personally. Just be like, yeah. okay, that's happened. You didn't, like, presumably they didn't do it to ruin the shot. They didn't do it to make your job harder. They're doing it because they're trying to do a good job and they're trying to make a good film. So just be like, okay, what do I do next? What's the next step? Not, oh my God, and just focus on what's happened. Go, okay, that's happened. The, the Jenny's blown. <laughs> We've lost all the power to lights. Okay, what's the next step? We need to get a new Jenny in. We need to check that the cables are all fine. We check the lights are fine. You know, communicate it to the ADs. And it's more about taking those practical steps. But I imagine it's one of the reasons it's so hard is because, especially early in your career, you're so passionate about being there and wanting to do a good job that that can become all-consuming. Uh, absolutely. And what I'd add is, and if you're the one who's mucked up and you're worried about people's reactions tell them as quickly as possible because it's film tends to have a lot of people a lot of money a lot of years of experience almost everything is solvable but it's n very rarely if ever going to get easier to solve the longer it takes for anyone to know what it is and the, the, the only cases where that's true is where the script changes and that this location fell through it doesn't matter because you're not going to film there anymore but that will happen once every blue moon so on the whole tell people straight away and then even then, when it is personally your fault and they attack you, don't take it personally. And that sounds really ridiculous, but the more you take things personally, the more ineffective you are. G Gordon Ramsay gave a great piece of advice for being a chef, which was uh, take it professionally, don't take it personally. So when you screw up, it matters, but it matters professionally. It does not have a reflection on who you are as an individual and being able to separate those two selves. I I have a question for you, Sam. So, so that we can focus on camera operating. On that vein, has there been a moment in which you've screwed something up on set relating to camera, and what was the impact, and how did you solve it? Great. You're just too perfect, Sam. <laughs> Most of them are like really small things that if you know kind of what you're doing, you can cover them up pretty quickly. Um, I mean, like there's a time I knew that I dropped a camera, but it was okay. It was an EX3. No one gave a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good advice for a camera operator. Try not to drop the camera. Yeah, don't, don't drop the camera. Yeah. But, yeah, but, no, I was holding a tripod um, and the tripod were busted. Don't use broken equipment. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> if you notice that the equipment is faulty, uh, don't use it. Don't try to like uh, strung up a bit or like continuing on with the day with this like broken equipment, especially if it's a tripod that's holding the camera. Like let someone know, oh, actually, I think 
maybe the, the I think the biggest mess up I've had was it was it was quite a tricky one. So it was uh, during a um, McLaren kind of like interview slash advert. Um, it was like an inside look at McLaren. So we we're at McLaren. Um, we had, I believe it was uh, gorgeous facility, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, we were walking through uh, this huge, uh, awesome place. Yeah, yeah, uh, and we had. Uh, our interviewer and is it Lando Norris, it was you with McLaren or is it someone else? I feel like I need to you know, quickly search this up to make sure that. Yeah, I was trying. Cool. Anyway. So yeah, we're walking through the facility uh, and uh, we're filming. Lando Norris was with us and someone else was in interviewing them. Uh, we had these filters in, which are like uh, black promise filters to make it look all nice and shiny. And we had two uh, city cam operators. So I was one of them and someone else was operating the other one. Obviously, I had to, couldn't do both. <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and an issue occurred was that... Uh, because there was these huge windows and it was just that point of day that the sun was shining through it was coming through the windows it was looked really nice up until uh you need a point towards the sun in which case the uh uh the filters was getting huge amounts of flare in them that was pretty much useless and the issue is that i was had the camera on me and so i couldn't really reach for it uh, and so I had to basically like move towards the uh, AC. It was really hard to do because there's only one AC for two cameras. And then they were able to pull out the uh, the filter. But the issue is that we had like, I don't know, maybe like a couple of minutes of film or footage there that I was just trying to avoid this light, which meant I was getting a worse shot, um, or a less desirable shot than I would have actually preferred to get. What do you think that you could have done prior to that situation to have avoided that? Or is it just one of those things the sun came through at a particular angle you couldn't have predicted? Um, I, yeah, I could have, I could have actually easily avoided that um, by going more around the areas, pointing it at the, uh, at our windows and just making sure there weren't any reflections. Uh, I mean, the filter wasn't even doing a lot, honestly. <laughs> Like it, it was just sort of a bad idea anyway, having it in there. Um, but I was like second camera for that. So I was like kind of less important. Whose idea was it to have it in there? Just to get an idea of how these things are set up. Was it a director or a producer or a talent? Who was it who said, let's do that? Uh, it was the producer, I believe. It's usually the producer's fault. <laughs> <laughs> um and no comment you're on <laughs> <laughs> i work as a producer that's what I <laughs> yeah. That. um yeah i mean it was to get like a better look and because obviously the issue was that both cameras had them in and so if one of them came out then one camera looks a little bit different from the other um really i should have been faster i should have just pulled it out uh the other issue is that for those that's worked with city cam uh putting off the balance even by that much, especially since it was a four by four filter with a f whole filter tray. Just whipping that filter tray out mess messed with the balance. Uh, and so it did become harder for me to operate, which was the other issue why I didn't really want to take it out because I knew it was going to make my job harder to do. Uh, but looking back of it, as soon as I saw that, I should have just pulled it back, knew that there was going to be someone else that they could have cut to, pull that filter out, and then try to hand it to the AC uh, and just got someone's attention faster than trying to work the shot with this thing, which just didn't really work out. So one thing that Danny and I realized prepping for this interview, as we don't work in camera, we only have a vague understanding of all the different roles and all the different departments and exactly what they do. So assuming that some people out there are listening to this because they love film but aren't necessarily yeah. camera people, would you be able to quickly go through uh, what a first AC is, what a second AC is, what's a 
clap a loader and just very quickly what all the different roles are in your department and how you rise up through them yeah so ac stands for assistant camera or camera assistant uh and so there's often three types of people that are assisting in uh camera so there's the uh trainee uh which is just being brought in that often helps with just the small menial tasks often getting like teas and also like cleaning out kit and carrying kit uh maybe driving uh some of the vehicles and that's really about it they're mostly there to learn uh but they're often <laughs> often given far too much to do uh they're often setting up monitors as well it's a very key thing that's a um trainee does mostly get themselves associated with like bnc cables because you'll be working with bnc cables a lot a lot if you're a uh trainee and uh what are bnc cables so bnc cables sdr cables so they're like uh imagine hdmi cables but on steroids uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh they're like the uh industry standard cables um they lock in they're great to use and if they break they're very easy to fix uh learning to fix them as well is actually a good trait to have uh because they're not it's not too hard but it is quite Valuable. a task to do yeah uh the second ac uh otherwise known as the a clapper or also sometimes known as the loader as well um usually but, if you work in film yeah the actual film itself rather than digital yes yeah uh, but so the second AC, your job is to often carry the cards. You might sometimes give that to the trainee, depending how far the DRT has decided to set the van up. Um, and DRT by, being uh, <laughs> digital imaging technician. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that just gets. The or as they're known for locations, people, the guy who's still on location after everyone's left and you can't lock up. <laughs> <laughs> they are there a lot. Also, the one that can seem to be get always forgotten about production when you're always like planning something yep. someone always forgets that the DIT needs to stay there for another two hours yep. because everyone would just want to go like, let's, let's just keep going yep. oh can I run this car to the DIT no 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 time we'll do that all at the end of the day mm. and it's like great now now the DIT is sitting there for four hours yeah. <laughs> and the DIT is backing everything up yeah yeah backing everything up sometimes they might also be doing a uh testing out the pitch as well so they're just trying out um like some color tests and stuff like that uh and they might also be uh linking the sound audio with the um visuals so sound are also providing all their files to dit yeah 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 just one whole big clump and then their job is to then separate them onto multiple different um hard drives and so there's one for like basically almost like everyone. Uh, so there's one for the producer, one for the director, one for the DRT, and then one for safety. It's often how it goes. There might also be another one. There might also be like a huge just like motherboard that they're also keeping. It's, there's a whole different kind of systems. Uh, and then anyway, going back to the ACs. Yeah. Uh, the first AC uh, is really like the leader of like the camera assistants. Um, it's quite easy to see where the hierarchy is. <laughs> Luckily, they just use numbers. Uh, otherwise known as a focus puller so their job is to pull focus on the camera so they might have a wireless focus puller so they have a small device that they can twist a little uh, little handle uh, that then talks to a motor that they've set up onto the lens that's a little gear head that's on uh, cinema lenses you probably if you're just starting out you wouldn't be using these lenses because they are just for like cinematography uh, they have gears along the sides or you can if you have a um more like uh, photography focus lenses. You can put gears on the sides of them uh, and you can pull focus through that. Uh, so you can do that wirelessly or you can go right up next to the camera and often have like a uh, the normal focus pulling system. Uh, and so their job is to make sure that the image is sharp. Um, and then we have the camera operator who operates the camera and then we'll have the cinematographer who then just talks to everyone below them. Uh, some shoots often don't actually have a cinematographer at times. Often like the camera operator, often part-time as the uh, DP. Um, DP being director of photography. Yeah, yeah. but it, uh, it really, really depends. Because um, so the, the cinematographer is designing the shot, designing the lights, that sort of thing, working with the director directly. And so I guess sometimes you wouldn't have one because maybe it's a commercial or it's a sort of shoot where it doesn't have to look quite as artistic. 
Is that right? Or is that yeah, so, well, especially if it's like um, we're mostly using like the environment um, and sometimes the director might be more involved with that. Uh, sometimes it's just harder to control and so you don't really need like a DP. Um, the DP is especially useful if you have like a larger team and sometimes the DP is just the camera operator as well. So as a camera operator, uh, I would often be asked my opinion on like framing and stuff like that. Sometimes also lighting as well. Um, and so if I, if we didn't have like a DP for that, and so if it's a smaller shoot, you don't exactly need someone that's dedicated for DP, especially someone that's dedicated for DP and a camera operator. They're often like one role. Has every director of photography come up through camera operating or can you come in as a director of photography not having worked in the camera oh, at yeah. the other stages? Yeah, yeah. No, you, uh, a quite a popular route is going from like art into uh, DP, uh, yeah, into DP. Because you don't, like having like basic knowledge about the camera equipment and lighting and rigging and all that kind of stuff is useful. But it's not needed because you have these amazing professionals around you all the time that can just do it for you. And you say like, oh, I really want some like a light coming from this way. And uh, I want it like this color and I want it to feel like this. And you talk that to the gaffer and they're like, all right, yeah, we can make that work. We're going to put this up there and we're going to put like a big old sketch stand and you're going to use this light. And, and it sort of like gives them what they want. So is it more important for the cinematographer to have that artistic skill? rather than the technical skill. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, it, as a DP, it's definitely more important than having that vision, especially if you're, because you're, you know, you're not the operator, you're the, you're the director, you're, the, you're, the, you're directing the photography of it. You're saying like, this is what I want this image to be, this is what I want it to say, uh, this is what's important for me, this is what's important for the shot. Um, and they're sort of keeping that in their mind for like, okay, what did the last shot have? What's the shot that's leading on from this? making sure all is consistent, all is good. And so they're less like bogged down with uh, like all the tactical stuff. Um, obviously, they'll pick it up as they go. Um, but it's a huge like broad spectrum of like DPs. There's a lot of DPs out there that also camera operate and uh, do all their own stuff, especially like on smaller shoots. Um, but it's not exactly like a need. So if you could surmise just... For anyone listening to this, so starting at camera trainee, where what's the way? What's the route up? And like a rough average of how long it tends to take at each grade. It's a how long is a piece yeah. of string question, but just as a yeah, because it, it really depends on like the person. Because some people just stick as trainees. Some people just really love just being a trainee, and they're like, I've been in this role for like 10, 15 years. And just love being a trainee. Uh, but now it's getting a little bit harder to actually be a trainee now that most of these roles are... It, crews themselves are getting smaller and smaller, especially as the technology is getting smaller and smaller and more advanced. You don't need as many people on set. Mm -hmm. uh, but typically how it would go would be uh, trainee. Uh, so you might have gotten that job through running or knowing an AC, uh, AC or there might be an advert out there. Are there any kind of Facebook or WhatsApp groups that you'd recommend camera enthusiasts join? Um, yeah, there's quite a few sort of like uh, people on set um, and just UK work and film. A lot of these, play, lot of these groups, it's all come and go though. Um, and so it's quite hard to just pick one and be like, that is what, that I'm going to stick with this group and it's going to be work. It's going to be really active. And then all of a sudden, like it's completely dead. Um, Instagram is also a good place, like uh, UK Filmworks. Uh, is UK Filmworks or like UK, w like working in film, something like that? Um, and all these sort of places that ad advertise jobs, uh, they often do it on their stories. So people put in their stories saying, We need like a trainee or an AC or someone, and you can just flip through it on your phone. And so that's pretty, that's a good one. I've gotten a few jobs through there. Um, and so that's a good place to try to start uh, and just uh, do you see that for the roles higher up 
or do those roles tend to be a bit more you've worked at another level and people will just hire you that worked with you? Uh, no, no, yeah, you still see them higher up. Um, but I mean, they are very broad. Like you could see one for UK film works, and someone's like, "Hey, does anyone know anyone like Baghdad?" It's like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm making that one. <laughs> my, my guy's he's working at the moment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so it's camera trainee, second AC, first AC, yeah, operator, DP, potentially DP if they're yeah. interested in going that route, or they just stay in in that ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, so it's like a yeah trainee. You're just like learning the ropes. You're learning what everyone does uh, until you get like enough confidence and you built up enough kit that you're like, okay, I'm ready for the next step. That could take one year that could be five years it really depends on until you feel that you are ready um it of, often what happens is that the industry says that you're ready and rent says that you're ready over than when you're ready <laughs> <laughs> you see a job going they're like all right we need a second ac it's paying this much are and, you ready you're offered it yeah. yeah you're like i'm gonna have to say yes i'm gonna have to, i'm gonna start to see how this goes it, it's amazing how much that wham, uh, hamster wheel functions across departments yeah <laughs> <laughs> particularly when you're hired for a job and then someone senior goes on to a job and they like everyone gets moved up one place yeah especially during the boom of oh, 2022 22. when it was so busy that they didn't have enough crew so i suppose then people just kind of jump into all sorts of things so if there's a really Oh no! I won't say. Yeah. <laughs> like, everything looks weird, but it probably doesn't. Probably mm. in, but from that period, yeah. So, just thinking on what you say about the crews getting smaller, where do you see camera operating going with the advent of AI or the industry in general? Is there a? What? And on that, have you seen Sora? No. So OpenAI, who created ChatGBT, have uh, released a video about a coming product. It's not available to the public yet. It's called Sora, uh, S-O-R-A. I recommend any listeners check it out. It's text to video, mm. and it's amazing. Like really? tourists walking through or people walking through Tokyo in the snow looks pretty close to, um, so virtually all or a significant amount of like establishers and GVs and, th- and so on will just get wiped by that. And t- t- so I was going to say a final point on that. Tyler Perry has actually just cancelled an $800 million construction project to build, I believe, 12 sound stages because he's gone. This is going to reduce the need to shoot on location. I'm just- you just basically horrified yeah. Sam. Yeah. <laughs> Sam really enjoying himself. <laughs> Sam, so, uh, yeah, from would, your perspective. Yeah. <laughs> What's your prospects of surviving nuclear war? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah oh, I didn't realize that AI already came that far. Because for me, AI video is still the <laughs> that short of Will Smith eating spaghetti. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or it's just trying try to get anyone to eat and like multiple fingers. Yeah. Uh, but I mean like, yeah, everyone knew it's going to come to that sort of stage um uh well i'm mostly trying to go more into the digital space anyway uh because i do not just for like uh adverts and films and music videos and stuff like that but i also do a lot of work in the digital space as you know um we, we hire sam at yeah. a motion capture studio so. uh and i've also Shout done out like, centroid yeah <laughs> <laughs> Um, and there's a there's a huge like still market out there for like it's the market's like shifting a lot and I think being a camera operator as well is learning how to like go with it like you either learn how to swim or you drown mm. really I mean like you you can say how unfair it is that AI is taking people's jobs or how fast technology is going but like you know it it it's just the way the world works it's just how things happen yeah. like. Um, even like like thousands of years ago when people were making like stone tools and then copper came along, there were stonemasons that were trying to emulate um, copper weapons but with stone and they're getting really, really good at it but it was just... <laughs> not, it was, as not as good. Yeah, they're, they're like, okay, we're going to try to make this. So there's, they found like sort of stone like swords and stuff like that that look in the same style that people have been making copper 
ice and saddle. So you can yeah. see where people in like in their fields yeah. of industry for yeah. like generations, for like millennia, has been like this is like this is an outrage. This is where I make my stand. <laughs> yeah. This is the where the, this is the true like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose camera people though, I find tend to be quite with the times as part of their role is keeping on top of how technology is developing because you can't be like right i know how to operate this particular camera because it could be outdated in 10 years time yeah so if you haven't gone with the flow of technology people will hire people who have so i suppose in that sense would you say camera departments at least will have the right mindset or to to kind of follow those changes uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, like there will always be some people that need to cover the niche of like basically backpedaling. Mm. Um, and because we're always, there will be someone that's wanted to do like a 16 millimeter film. Like I've worked with 16 mil. I have actually soon about to go onto a set. I'm actually about to go from a motion capture set for, for three days uh, where we're working completely in a digital space uh, and just like the height of like... Uh, to a technology and film at the moment to go onto a 16 mil set where I'm going to be loading 16 millimeter film. And so it's, it's really like learning all the skills that you can and knowing that skills that you learn, especially in your field are never going to be redundant. Um, yeah, they're never going to be redundant. Uh, that's why I went off to learn how to do film really just in case there's something that might come up that, I need to learn film. And like I did, because I've got a few jobs loading film. Uh, but at the same time, I also need to know how to keep up with the times, the most recent technology, how to camera operate in on a computer, which yeah. I've, lo- I've taught myself how to do. I've downloaded Unreal Engine and I can cam- now camera operate inside a digital space. Are there any courses screen skills udemy youtube that you used when you were teaching yourself um i just sort of like had a project in my i just i found the best way to teach myself especially stuff on the computer is you have like a a project in mind being like okay i want to what goes into if i wanted like a really short scene i want like two people walking with each other and i need some camera like some camera movements or even just like experimenting with it, just type that in YouTube, like Unreal Engine camera operating, and then you just follow along with them. Uh, luckily, Unreal Engine is completely free. Uh, it doesn't need to take that much computer power either, uh, and you can teach yourself with that. Uh, through film, uh, going back, I went on a specific course for that. I went to NFTS for a year, uh, learning how to uh, AC, uh, their way um and i taught i got taught like a lot of valuable skills through that but the main reason i went there was so i can just load film and taking notes and film taking notes as an ac is really important especially the second ac like hot i say over half your job is like writing constantly every single shot needs to be in your notebook and, and what kind of form do those notes take uh, so they'll take the form of like uh, what the take is, state number. Um, if you work on film, it, you need to put down how much uh, feet of film that you've used for that uh, for that take, and then uh, anything else that's on there. So like the what uh, lens you're using, uh, if there's any filters, what those filters are, um, and those kind of things. Maybe there might be extra stuff for VFX. So like how tall was the camera and what angle were you shooting at? And then you can transfer all those notes into a camera sheet report, which they, you very rarely use nowadays, um, especially in the digital era. Um, but there's still some larger productions that still use them and they're very useful to have to make sure that you have everything. But especially using film, uh, you definitely need all those notes because everything is physical. Um, in the digital era then does that all get logged automatically that the camera just tells the computer is that uh, why i just feel that because the crews are getting smaller people are less trained of knowing what note taking is uh and but presumably those that information hasn't become less relevant or has it for the editor um i 
I can't really speak too much for all the editors, but all the editors that I know, they don't really work off camera sheets. Um, yeah. I mean, like it's, it's always a good thing to have, but I don't know that many people that would be like, oh, we need camera sheets for this. I've only been on, I think like one other production that was like a professional production uh, that we properly went into like using the camera sheets. I mean, it, it also depends on what the production is. If it's like, a, if you're shooting for like three months, four months, you would 100% need camera sheets. Like if it's like a full like feature film, you're going to need camera sheets. That is something you're definitely going to need. If it's like a commercial that's one day, probably not as much because the editor can kind of just all go through it. Absorb look it, it all. all. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So who would read the camera sheets after they've been created? Uh, the editor cool. um, and uh, the lab if um, they're using film. Uh, maybe the director. And there's also a copy for the uh, production as well for the producers uh, you really just get like one sheet and then underneath that sheet is a whole lot of carbonated sheets so they just copy on each other so really you have like six sheets for all these other type of people also one for vfx and all that kind of stuff and is there a software that you guys use or is all by hand uh, all by hand wow honestly there's very there are very few film-based cam ops not cam ops like operators um loaders and stuff and it's a talent like when you find a really good one because you can very easily just over <laughs> a really bad one would just expose the film when you're using it and yeah and you need like logs of all the stuff that you've had because is it because it's a physical thing you're using it up you're you're using up as well like that's like the only copy like, you can't be like okay Take it from the camera, from the card. Copy saved. <laughs> copy saved like to multiple places. It's like, yeah. that's the only one. And until that goes to like the lab and is scanned, that is the only one. If that's misplaced somewhere with like, because yeah. it's not like, you know, you get like a hard drive for like a month worth of footage. It's like that big. A month worth of footage of film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to the floor. Because... <laughs> Wasn't there a thing about how long the film for Oppenheimer was if you laid it in a straight line? Yes, it was like, yeah. yeah I remember something like <laughs> I'm that. blanking now. Was a so fantastic. I think we'll start drawing this to a close. Um, if people were interested in hiring you, Sam, mm -hmm. what's the best way for them to reach you? Uh, they can find me on Instagram as it's my name, Sam Losey Williams. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn same name uh and those are probably the two top ways of finding me there's also like my email which uh you're honestly probably more likely to find me on instagram <laughs> and like uh messenger and stuff like that um mostly because uh my uh email like everyone else is constantly full of stuff yeah so we'll um, we'll, we'll put some of these in our show notes if if you're happy with that yeah and people can find you that way if I can be massively cheeky, I had one final question, mm. which is what do you think are the skills, traits, habits that make someone particularly suited to camera relative to the rest of the industry? So if you've got someone, they know what they want to work on film and they'll hear this description and go, yeah, that aligns with me. I should take a look at camera. Uh, someone that's good at communicating. Uh, and also someone that loves just looking for a viewfinder. Uh, that is actually like a skill to just be like looking and just sort of picturing stuff, how it will be through a lens. Um, so like a good imagination. Um, organized. Uh, good at withholding information. Uh, so not just like about the movement and about everyone else. Uh, it's good special awareness as well on top of that. Um, but also, yeah, so uh, information about like your kit that you're using, uh, its limitations uh, and how far you can push it. Um, and a good like vision for what you want something to look at the end um, and not worrying about like someone that's wants to like keep going, someone that uh can like push themselves uh but also like know themselves know their body uh so they don't get like injured 
it's a film is it like it's a marathon or a sprint absolutely um and being like also being friendly as well that's why we keep hiring sam yeah. <laughs> <laughs> amazing thank you so much for your time thanks sam thank you